Hello everybody and welcome to the Philippines Safe Abortion Advocacy Network Pinsan Podcast and I am pleased to introduce to you a very special guest. Her name is Ramona Diaz and she's the director of that very important movie that you should all see. It's called Motherland. Welcome to the program, Ramona. Ah, uh, it's nice. It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's our pleasure. And it was my pleasure to see the movie. I, I got the opportunity to see it twice, actually, which is a very lucky thing because a lot of the advocates really do not have that opportunity yet. But this film has been around the world. Can you tell us the reach of this movie so far? Well, you know, Motherland premiered at Sundance in January. So January of this year, we're now November. So it's been very many months after that was a world premiere. And then the international premiere was at the Berlinale, which is a Berlin International Film Festival, another top tier festival. And after the, those two premieres, it just went all over. I mean, it's been all over so many festivals all over the world um, in Asia, but it took until November to get to the Philippines. <laughs> you know, it took like, oh my God, 11 months. And I was really determined. I was telling um, the activista folks that I, I'm determined to have this film shown before 2017 ends. Because, you know, Motherland's here was 2017. We're yeah. coming to the close of it. Yeah. It's already out. It's been already on um, US broadcast. It's on already PLA. on Amazon, actually. It's already on Amazon, yeah. on uh, iTunes. Uh, DVD and Blu-ray is available in the US already. It's also on Hulu, I think, and some other wow. digital platforms. It's going to be on Netflix in the UK in December. We are looking forward to that. Netflix is already a thing here, so... Ah, yeah. it is, but it might be geo-blocked, right? So, uh, yeah. because Netflix is geo-blocked. So, it's going to be Netflix UK, but not necessarily We will else. fight for it to be on the Netflix Philippines. Well, if, if Netflix buys it, then, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And we are very thankful that you mentioned Activista, and we're very thankful to Dakila for, you know, chancing upon that conversation with you that eventually led to its showing here. And you've done several very good documentary films, like your... Spirits Rising, Imelda, you know, The Learning. These are very good stories and I haven't seen them myself, but from the people who have reviewed them, they've all called it like essential viewing, especially when you want to learn about those issues. And you've mentioned yourself on your website that the themes you work on have to do with power. So can you tell us like through these films, how you explore the dynamics of power and especially women and power? Well, I'm, I'm interested in power and disempowerment, right? Yeah. Because I, I deal with both. I, I think I like the dynamics of power. Like with Imelda, I just, um, uh, it was interesting how, she, to me, what was most interesting is how she wielded power and how she played with myth to maintain power, right? And people bought into the myth until they didn't, right? And then they broke free of that myth. And then I'm, uh, and then I also, on the other hand, also look at, very disempowered women, like teachers. Um, the, the learning is actually about uh, Filipinos who were recruited to teach in the Baltimore public school system. And those women were like cornered by circumstance, right? They needed to do something about their lives because they couldn't earn the living here. And they did something and very proactively moved to the US. And that's, that's a story. And that was to me very interesting, uh, which was like a mirror the opposite of the same coin with Imelda, I felt. Because yeah. they were both, uh, you know, having to do with women's stories. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, Don't Stop was my dude film. <laughs> uh, yeah. About Arnel Pinedo, which is also very interesting. I'm a huge fan of that song. Yeah. That band and Arnel Pinedo. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was, that was interesting. That was a film you couldn't pass up because it was right. I mean, I couldn't not do it. It right? was a great story. Yeah. No, it, and it was a wonderful thing to film. And, you know, and... Uh, in a way, I'm still telling uh, the same story. I mean, Arnell is like the biggest OFW. He calls himself like the most <laughs> successful OFW. So my themes are still, you know, run the same, are still in the same trajectory, right? And then, and then there's Motherland. Like, you know, the most disempowered, I think, of the uh, Filipino women that I've ever filmed. Yeah. And, yeah, and in this story, unlike in the others, like there's a part of the movie where they eventually get their power. Like in Spirits Rising, it was... A, of course, that huge victory of people power. And then there was the learning where they, you know, take, took care of their own lives. But in powerless, the, I mean, in motherland, it was really about powerlessness. 
Like for some women there, you know, their power wasn't shown. You know, they, they end, you, the movie ended with them still being in that situation. Absolutely. But I think um, what drew me to Motherland really were, um, I think I, I mentioned this during the screening or during the Q&A after the screening was um, the communities of women. I, I mean, and the, sort of the sisterhood in that hospital, you know, the, these bonds that form amongst these women who are very, um, very little, right? I mean, they, they really, they're, they're near to nothing, and yet they're very generous and gracious with each other. So that was what yeah. I was interested in. That, that's what really drew me. And I think there's a certain power in that. There's a cer certain power, and also I gave them the power to tell their stories on their own terms. Um, I didn't want poverty to define them. You know, what defines them is being women and being human at the end, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're sexual, they're, they're body, they're, they're funny, you know, they're irreverent. Um, and, but they're also kind and gracious and, and they're also very flawed. I mean, Lerma, one yeah. of the women, wants to go home and I hope people can, you know, my hope is that people can understand why she wants to go home, but she's sort of, you know, uh, you know, she's yeah. sort of tough and puts her husband where, you know, yeah. misplaced, but she's a very flawed character. So, you know, uh, it's complicated and layered and nuanced and that's the whole point, I, I think. That's one of the reasons I really love the movie. Like, I came into it, I didn't really know what to expect, but, you know, just watching the trailer, like, you couldn't really grasp, like, how rich the movie was in terms of showing the contrast. Like you show them in their most weak points, you know, some might even think undignified imagery, but they are also like their dignity is really on display there when, as you said, they form these communities. This is a bit of a spoiler where, you know, they even share breastfeeding duties, like what little food that they had, they shared among themselves and even just the simple laughter that they shared with each other. It yeah, really was yeah. a powerful connection. Yeah, and I, I loved how um, purely, um, uh, you know, the, it was important for me to show them as sexual beings, you know? Yes. Right, and not be afraid of that. I think because it's important. Definitely. I mean, that's part of being a woman, part of a lot, you know, part of why the uh, familia, you know? But I think it was important to f show them in the in its in their as holistic like full bodied women. Yes. And I think uh, I I also didn't want to be too sentimental over them, right? Yeah. Because uh, I think that would have been I, I don't think I would be, have been comfortable sentimentalizing yeah. them, and I don't think that's a good film. It was too. indeed <laughs> it was yeah. indeed very real. Like you yeah. could have portrayed the service providers, you know, the, the nurses and the doctors to be these perfect heroes. But they too are flawed in the movie. And we had some things to criticize about them. But then even you showed very clearly in the movie that they were in these circumstances where they did not have the, the luxury to provide, you know, that best care that they can give because of the sheer volume of the patients they had yeah, but at that hospital. In spite of that, they managed to make it all work. It really is organized chaos in it that is. place. I mean, they have visiting hours twice a day where in all these um, relatives and husbands or partners or boyfriends come visit their wives, but the, the, uh, or, or partners, the women, the mothers, and the, the women have to come out. I mean, the women come to them instead of them going to, because they're in a ward, right? And you can't control disease and all that so the the person who's being visited comes to the visitor i've never seen that before and it's an ongoing traffic in and out during yeah. those visiting hours and the bringing of food and the paging the women and and they do that twice a uh, twice a day yes and yeah it's just re and then in between of course is all the care that can ha happen you know and all, a lost baby or you know the the, the name tag gets you know, this uh, falls off the wrist of the baby and, the, you know, all all kinds of problems ensue from that, yes, right? Yes. So it's, and th that's, you know, we spent seven, six and a half weeks there and th that's only six and a half weeks. A lot of other things 
you know, didn't happen that in those six and a half weeks that usually happen too. Like the power outage during that, uh, that yeah, typhoon. Yeah, yeah, the, there was a typhoon when we um, during the our fear, uh, when we were shooting, and we couldn't get to the hospital. But you know, yeah, power outage. Uh, there was no running water. Yeah, you know, that's a problem for a hospital. Definitely, so. for RH advocates. Paying a visit to Fabele is kind of like a rite of passage. Like a lot of us. Is it really? Yeah. Ah, like, okay. Th- like you will be told, you know, if you want to see the reality of the RH situation in this country, you have to visit Fabella. And we have, a lot of our friends have, and those who have seen your movie, they are like, how did she get access to those scenes? We have never seen that side of Fabella yet. And I will leave you your trade secrets, but if you want to see that side of Fabella that not even the, mo- the most committed of RH advocates have seen, you have to see this movie, Motherland. So you have seen this movie hundreds of times hundreds by now. By now, yes. Like you, you probably <laughs> have memorized like the of dialogue course, yeah. and the scenes. So what, ha- what have those insights, what, are, what new insights have you lately realized? Like over those many viewings, you know, like maybe there is something you wanted to have featured but did not, or maybe you wanted to take something out, or there's some new insight about the people that you didn't uh, notice in those first few viewings. Um, gosh, that, that's a hard, that's a difficult question, I think, because it requires me to step back and think of it critically after the fact, right? Yeah. Because you really think of it critically as you cut, as yes. you cut the film. I mean, there were a lot of things that um, that really didn't strike me until we were cutting. You know, uh, the fact that um, you know the, the numbers game. What I call the numbers game. Everyone has a number, and everyone's called that yeah. either by their number or mother, right? Yeah. Right. Nine or or um, five to one. Five, five to one. Yeah. But at the end of the day. You know, when you really look at it, all these nurses and all these caregivers uh, very, know who that woman is across the table from them. Know them. They they probably have literally seen them before the last, you know, the past year, past yeah. couple of years, and understand their plight and like have patience enough to sit there for like, I don't know, twenty minutes trying to advise them to probably take the IUD. You know, take um, yeah, think of family planning. So it's a very personal thing. It is. When seemingly it's not, when you first visit the hospital, seemingly it's cold because it's numbers and everyone is called mother. When it isn't, when you stay longer, you're like, oh my God, what, what personal care? I mean, that's amazing. It is amazing. And for us advocates, we keep mentioning that 12 or 14 women die every day, and that's the number. But what you've shown is more than just numbers. These are people with interesting individual stories and I wouldn't be surprised if someone watches your movie and wants to make a fictional kind of movie with that sort of setting. There could even be a TV series like Downton Abbey. Tell where us the, there, yeah. You know, the, <laughs> the lives of those women but relating to each other. But they're not Real people are more interesting sometimes. I, I agree. These people, yeah. these people are very yeah. interesting. So speaking of those multiple viewings, you've shown it to several audiences around the world. What are the most interesting reactions that you've gotten from the audiences? You've already shared one, like how they thought Filipino husbands were so nice, like asking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that was really funny. Are yeah. all Filipino husbands supportive? I'm like, <laughs> no, they're, they're, you know, Filipino men are like men everywhere in the world. Some are supportive, some are not. <laughs> you know, it's about being men and not necessarily Filipino men. Yeah. But I think um, the, the, a couple of things. People are always struck by the silence of the labor ward. You know, that the women were not screaming, were not, you know, making a scene when there are so many women laboring in one room. That is true. I, I never and really no noticed asked, that. No one asked during the Q&A and I was surprised. Yeah, I, yeah And right. it struck me when we were, we were filming and it struck my, uh, my cinematographer who's, you know, who's American, Nadia. She goes, wow. She goes, wow, this is such a quiet space when we expected it to be noisier. Chaos, right? Yeah, right. right. Um, and it's interesting. And um, uh, someone explained to me, be, be, it's, it's again a, a very um, 
social economic thing, social econ economic thing, you know, because uh, they feel like they're there in, due to the largest of the government, yeah. right? And they shouldn't, you know, make a fuss, yeah. right? Kind and so like they're quiet. Being in an elevator that's crowded with people and you're not supposed to make a sound. Yeah, exactly, kind of. exactly. So, you know, just be quiet, have your baby, get on with it. Don't don't make a fuss, don't be quiet. That, that's what, how someone explained it to me at Fobelia because it really struck me. I'm like, w w which makes sense, right? Yeah. I'm like, huh, that makes sense. The other thing that we're really interested about, especially um, the audiences in the U.S. are the insurance, f how health insurance works here. Because there, we have Phil Health for the purely indigent, you know? And, um, and it works. Things are free at, to a certain point, yeah. I think. And over 70 years old, I think, care is free, health care yes. is free. That is such a shock to U.S. to, to U.S. Uh, viewers because, of course, we're always having the battle over health insurance, right? Yeah, Obamacare universal healthcare. And, yeah, yeah. And, you know that's always constant, especially now. So to them, it's like, what is this? What, what explain to us? You have insurance? I'm like, of course we have health insurance, but especially for the indigent, yeah. there, you know, and that's always a conversation. Yeah. So these things, you know, how silent it is in the world because they're embarrassed to make a fuss you know it relates back to power and this is of course the very poor or disadvantage that you showed in your movie but as a whole what do you think the situation is for women in the philippines like are they empowered compared to when you started looking at the situation of women that was back in the 80s or even before that so ha have we progressed enough now where do you think filipino women are now in that sense of being empowered depends what class you are okay you know a more educated more moneyed class they're more empowered right they go out there they have jobs they are i think um they're taking more control of their lives they leave their their uh, family homes earlier because I, I think in the past in the past right as a if you're a single if you're single you live in the par in the home of your parents but now that's less that's happening less and less. If you go get a job, you can move out and have an apartment. But that's for the educated, right? Upper middle class to upper class. Yeah. But you're talking about the rest of the country. What, what is the percentage? I mean, what, what is the poverty line? I mean, the rest of the women are still very bound by tradition and gender roles. And, and also, you know, the, the whole system does them in, right? It's systemic. There's no divorce in this country. So... The, the, the man just leaves and they're stuck with all the children. They have no recourse, so they just move on to their next relationship. So, um, so re it really depends. It depends yeah. on what, what class and what, what level of education you have. Yeah, and of course the hope is for us to kind of bring up that average so that everyone's situation, regardless of where they are in terms yeah. of class, improves. And yeah, so it's it's funny to me when people always say, "Oh, yeah, in the Philippines, in the Philippines, you know, it's run by women." I'm like, "Yeah, rich women." <laughs> I mean, it's not yeah. necessarily across the classes, economic classes. That's not true. I haven't found that to be, especially after like filming with um, with the teachers and and you know the women in motherland. Yeah, and that that's where the discussion on justice <laughs> and intersectionality kind of comes in. And to improve the situation of women and all people who are disempowered, it's important to have advocacy. And one important or very effective way of advocacy is storytelling. So I wanted to know, like, how do we get our advocates to kind of harness that power of storytelling that you wield so, so well? And maybe the other way around, like, how can we get more storytellers like you to be advocates for causes that we support? Yeah. You know, I don't know. Uh, to me, I consider myself a filmmaker, right? And I, we were speaking earlier about issues. And I'm, I've always said I don't make films about issues. I make films about people and people I'm drawn to and stories and, and the human condition. That's what I'm interested in. And, if, uh, and, and obviously, because I, I guess of my own liberal bias, right? I am drawn to those stories that have that bent. Um, that's my, and so my only, my, my job as a filmmaker is to put people in other people's shoes that they would otherwise not be in, right? And give you a broader view of the world and be more empathetic, right? And change. So it's change. It's very incremental change within the person. 
But if advocates then watch my film and see, oh, it matches their advocacy, just like Motherland and the RH advocates, I'm down for the cause. I'm like, yeah, you can use my film because it aligns with my own personal beliefs. So that, that's how I see it. Um, how to, but I think people who are drawn to making documentary films are advocates and activists already, yeah. right? Activity. Especially here, the, the women I've met, they are already, and I think they start from that. They start um, uh, in activism first and then are drawn to uh, make films. Right? So let's say... Uh, but but that, that is a history of documentary. It's yes. rooted in, you know, in activism. So I want to be an advocate, activist, documentary filmmaker. What are some words of wisdom, you know, that that you, from all your years of experience, can impart that you, you know, you wish you, you could have given yourself when you started? That, you know, that issues don't make a film. You know, your advocacy is not the film. You have to find true stories that will resonate with people who are not on your side, right? You, you have to give them a way in because that's the only way that it'll, your film will go beyond the converted Otherwise, you're just talking in this yeah. echo chamber, right? Yeah. Preaching and that's, to the choir, yeah. Exactly. So you don't want to preach to the choir. You want to go beyond that. And so you have to give those people a way into your story. And usually a way into your story, it should transcend the specifics of your story. You know, the kumbaga to be more universal. But yeah. it's true. It has to transcend it. And, um, and that would be my biggest advice. So don't think of, you know, it, of course, your, your advocacy and your issue will be will inform your choices of stories, obviously. But you can't be making a film about just the issue. No one will listen except the people who already believe in it, right? Yeah. And, and so what's the point? And there's so much propaganda already going around in this country. For sure. Yeah. And then you're just making another PSA and propaganda. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think those films also don't, um, don't last, you know? Yeah. So what's next for Cine Diaz? What are you working on next? I can't really talk about it. Oh, okay. No, there is a media blackout on my oh. next film. Okay. So, yeah, I can't. Sorry. We will look forward to that, whatever it is. And how do we watch, like, what can we expect about Motherland? A lot of oh people gosh, have yeah. been, I'm sure people have been hounding you left and right. And, yeah. you know, so we, we've had real conversations with um, Lenny Velasco of Activista yeah. because there's a real um, interest in um, touring this film to all the like um, colleges and universities and communities and we I, I do understand from um, from just distribution in the US really sometimes you can't expect the audience to come to you yeah. you got to go to them because audiences right now have so many choices they can stay in their house Netflix in their homes and yes and stream everything under the Sun so you got to go to them now and that doesn't necessarily mean and it's difficult, obviously, and it needs a lot of logistics and stuff. But I think there's enough will. And, and, and I told Lenny, I, again, I'm down for the cause. Yes, I can. Of course, I have a distributor that they have to go through. And it's technical, but I've already, they know, my distributors know that the Philippines is like a special place that I want to, you know, it's not about, at the end of the day, it's not about the distribution fee. It is about getting a lot of eyes, eyeballs on it. Yeah. So they're very serious discussions and I hope it happens. I really do. And I will, I told Lenny, I will fully support it because I think, yeah, I think this film and it's surprising. I mean, it's so heartwarming to see all the like posts and all the reactions I've been getting. It really is. I'm like, wow. Okay. On, I on, see it in fresh, you know, through fresh eyes, which is weird. On my part, you know, on our part, we will work very hard so Thank that this you. movie get seen by the eyeballs of Tito Soto and, ah, well, and, and yeah. his ilk and his ilk. So you've Good luck with that <laughs> and the CBCP. Yes, and, and the CBCP. CBC, yeah. You've mentioned several times that your movies do not have a message. You know, it's all about the story. So I will end this podcast by asking you to give a message to the women, to the Filipinos. Like what, what sort of message could you... If you, you to know, the Filipinos to or the, the message, especially to the to especially to the storytellers women, really. or yeah, just oh that's hard. I hate to give you know, <laughs> that, that, I, it's, it's it's tough for me to it's give very a message. Tough, yeah. It? yeah, it's like oh gosh, who are you to give a message? I never feel like that empowered to give messages. Yeah. Uh, I can give a message though to like storytellers, okay, female storytellers. Okay, let's do that. Um, um, 
I, I'm all about claiming your narrative, claiming your own narr narrative. No, you know, you should be telling your own stories. Don't let other people tell your stories for you. You know, and now in this day where technology and um, film equipment, you know, video cameras, etc., is so easily accessible, you can shoot, you know, films on your iPhone. I think, yeah, yeah, do it. Claim your narrative. Tell your own stories. Thank you so much, Ramona. You're it's very welcome. This is fun. Yes.